Really happy to have you all join us tonight. And I'll ask you to find a seat at our informal town meeting here at the Norman Rockwell Museum. This is the fourth in our series of four Freedoms Forums that we have held this, this winter, our second year of forums inviting community conversation and civil discourse around really complicated, big, important topics. Uh, I'm delighted to see so much interest in discussing the economy tonight here in the Berkshires and a lot of people in the room with a lot of know-how, so it should be an interesting conversation. Uh, the way I start these forums, and for anyone I don't know, I'm Laurie Norton Moffat, director of the museum, but I think maybe I know all of you here. Uh, I try to give a little big picture, 30,000 foot preamble to the topic. Uh, we've selected topics of national and global impact and importance, and we try to look at them on a community level. But I'd like to set the stage with some big picture thinking, some history, and then we'll be hearing from our thought leaders, uh, experts on this topic of economics and the Berkshire economy. And then we invite you to come to the podium and we'll have a conversation like a town hall meeting. You can ask a question, you can make a statement, you can agree or disagree with the speaker before you. Uh, all we'll ask is that it all be done with civility, which was the other goal of this forum, was to really help model for our nation a way to talk about difficult topics uh, with respect and civility. I have no doubt. We haven't had an uncivil forum yet, but that was one of our goals in doing this program. So economics. True confessions. This was my least favorite subject in college. I actually challenged my professor, who said everything had a monetary value, to a debate. What about aesthetics, I asked. Philosophy, religion, how can you put a value on those? They exist in a world of thought without monetary value. But I was apparently not very persuasive. I received a C plus for my efforts. How is it then that I now lead a four and a half million dollar, albeit not for profit business, and have helped to organize two community economic development engines, Berkshire Creative Economy Council and One Berkshire, whose mission is to advance economic growth and development in the Berkshires by offering a seamless, unified economic development engine that leverages our cultural, creative, and commercial resources. Can the power of collaboration, of being small and nimble, doing business locally, bolster the local economy, especially in view of the global recession? What if economic vitality was measured by happiness and access to enough goods and services for all to enjoy a healthy and happy life? What is economics? By definition, it is the social science that analyzes the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Our United States Constitution protects life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but makes no provision for wealth for her citizens. Our government, however, is responsible for establishing the economic systems by which our economy runs. Our United States democracy operates on an economic system of capitalism, defined as a philosophy of economic systems that is generally considered to favor, favor private ownership of the means of production, creation of goods or services for profit or income by individuals or corporations, competitive markets, voluntary exchange, wage labor, capital accumulation, and personal finance. The goal is to create wealth for individuals, and some say, including our Supreme Court, that corporations are individuals too. We also have a large social enterprise system in our nation that is organized around not-for-profit principles, a term which generally refers to an organization that uses its surplus revenues, if you ha are lucky enough to have them, to achieve its goals rather than to distribute them to individuals as profit or dividends. And here, the economic value is measured in the delivery of a social good, whereby the citizens, including the government, agree that the product or service generated by the not-for-profit is of value to society, exempting the organization from paying taxes. Not-for-profits account for only about 9% of all wages in the United States, but an immense number of jobs. $1.4 trillion in total spending, which accounts for about 5.4% of our gross domestic product, uh, is generated through not-for-profits. And here in the Berkshires, a study conducted by 
Steve Shepard at Williams College for the Berkshire Chamber of Commerce found that in the time period of the study, in the late 2000s, the number of not-for-profits per, per 10,000 individuals of population is higher in Berkshire County than in Massachusetts as a whole, and more than double that of the United States. I guess that's good news in the amount of services delivered to residents of the region, but that's also a very high bar of support required by a rural region to help all of them thrive. For this, private wealth is necessary for sustenance of most not-for-profit organizations. As the distribution of wealth amongst the citizens in our nation widens, more people have need of the services of NPOs, and more wealthy citizens are therefore needed to support these non-governmental services that subsidize society. Individuals and foundations gave more than $250 billion to charities in 2010. Daily, we hear about the economy in the news. Our gross domestic product, GDP, trillions of dollars of debt, the recession, unemployment, housing foreclosures, banking collapse, real estate market collapse, crushing student loans, spiraling health care costs, credit card debt, low household savings rates, taxes, working capital, social security, investments, markets, energy costs. These are just a few of the economic topics and concepts a citizen needs to know about today to be knowledgeable and operate in the world. I guess that economics course I took was pretty important. Um, there are a number of systems needed for a community to conduct business successfully. These can include a barter system, a monetary value system, a banking system, access to capital, supply of goods and services, and consumer or business demand for these services, transportation services, I would say communication services today, and a tax base. Global systems like credit cards, digital banking systems, online money, mobile swiping devices, transit systems, uh, communication systems all make it possible for commerce across borders, not just state and uh, domestic borders, but global borders as well. In tonight's forum, the final in our winter spring series, we ask, in our town, can our local economy thrive in the face of the national recession? How are we doing in the Berkshires in this arena? In our previous forums, we examined a number of the social challenges in our community. Access to health care, health and wellness, access to nutritious food, education. These were very complex topics. By any definition, we are a rural area, lowly populated, measuring some of the highest poverty rates in the state of Massachusetts. It is clear that there is a correlation between poverty, income, health and education, and access to jobs, which can elevate a family or individual out of the poverty cycle. So how can a business flourish and produce these jobs that our citizens need? And how can they be educated and to be able to do these jobs well. I personally believe that the Berkshires, which is bolstered by an outside economy in the form of the high percentage of residences who maintain homes in the Berkshires uh, from out of the area, their demand for good food, access to culture, and other amenities uh, help our community thrive. But we must find a way to educate and connect all of our able citizens to jobs that break the cycle of poverty that so many of our region's residents experience. The national unemployment rate is currently at 8.2%. The local rate is slightly lower, or better, than the national average at 7.9%, and the seasonally adjusted rate last summer was at 6.4%. We have a way to go to getting to full employment, which is never zero. A uh, recent scan, however, of job postings in the region reveal that more, there are more than 100 openings of creative sector jobs, and there are nearly 600 employees, employers looking for employees right now in the Berkshires. So there are jobs out there. Organizations such as Berkshire Grown, which connects farmers and locally raised food to local farmers markets, grocers and restaurants, and Berkshire Creative, which unites and sparks creative collaboration amongst creative workers and businesses, or regional development alliances such as the Berkshire Visitors Bureau and our chamber, Chambers of Commerce play important roles in connecting workers with jobs and consumers. 
We also have two leading national, global economic think tanks here in the Berkshires. And we did invite them to be with us tonight, but they were unable to come, the New Economics Institute and the American Institute for Economic Research. They do their work quietly. Uh, the New Economics Institute, which uh, formerly was and in included the Schumacher Society in South Egremont, is working to effect a transition to a new economy, a new philosophy of organizing the economy, an economy that gives priority to supporting human well-being and the Earth's natural systems. They seek to describe an alternative socioeconomic system that is capable of addressing the premise that a fair and sustainable economy is possible and that ways must be found to realize it. They believe that wealth is not the sole measure of economic success. Environmental pollution, degradation of ecosystems, equal access to assets, water, food, work, and health, and well-being of citizens must be factored into measuring economic su success and sustainability. They are the leaders behind our local currency, Berkshires, and believe in systems that put people and the planet first. Many uh, younger, genera in our younger people in our new generation subscribe to this philosophy. I see it all the time in young mothers and sustainable living, uh, people having a different vision on what a community success is, and I would say this might characterize the 99% Occupy movement. Uh, they, they also note on their website, Adam Smith conceptualized the possibility of accumulating capital, physical capital, supported and represented by financial capital, to improve the human condition. His vision empowered two centuries of extraordinary advances in productive output for human consumption. Some of his followers made the simple mistake of confusing growth in gross, gross national product with growth in real wealth and welfare while others, like Ruskin and Schumacher, saw a growing divergence between the multiplication of goods and money versus improvements in the real wealth that includes happiness, human relations, and preservation of a healthy natural environment. The American Institute for Economic Research, called AIER, located in Great Barrington, is one of the oldest economic research organizations in the United States. Uh, ARI, as I call them when I drive by, conducts independent scientific economic research to educate individuals and thereby advancing uh, their personal interests and those of the nation. They were formed in 1933 in response to the magnitude of the Great Depression, which suggested the need for a research organization to inquire into the wide range of economic, social, and monetary developments that had contributed to the catastrophic economic contraction. I think we've just come through a similar, maybe not quite so dire, but nearly so dire period. The hope then was that by further developing and applying modern scientific procedures of inquiry, results could be obtained that would be useful to the nation in avoiding a repetition of the disaster. Financial support for their institute is provided primarily by the small annual fees from several thousand sustaining members by receipts from sales of its publications and by tax deductible contributions, there are 501c3, uh, and by earnings of its wholly owned investment advisory organization. They believe that useful information and advice on economic subjects are, are, is most useful when it comes from an independent source devoid of special interests. In light of our recent Great Recession, I hope the world is listening to the work of these two organizations or perhaps finding it helpful. And I'm sorry they couldn't be here tonight, but I recommend their websites to you. There's a lot of interesting reading on them, even for a non-economist. So tonight we have three leading economic voices of our Berkshire community to spark our conversations. Uh, Nathaniel Carnes is the executive director of the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission the agency responsible for administration, economic and community development, transportation planning, and regional planning for the Berkshires. And that is responsible for the overall operation of the agency under the direction of the commission. And he represents the agency with local, regional, state, and federal officials, managing staff to ensure that the mission of the agency as well as regional and local needs are being met and that uh, adopted regional policies are complied with. 
Keith Gerard is with the Massachusetts Small Business Development Center Network and has been a senior business advisor with the Mass Small Business Development Center since December 2007. He is also the regional director for the office and prior to joining uh, this group, Keith operated his own business consulting firm and served as an adjunct faculty instructor in business management at Berkshire Community College. He also held the position of executive director for the Community Development Corporation of South Berkshires and served as a senior administrator at Berkshire County ARC. And Pam Malumphy is the economic development specialist for One Berkshire, the Strategic Alliance of Berkshire Creative, Berkshire Chamber of Commerce, the Berkshire Visitors Bureau, and Berkshire Economic Development Corporation. Pam was the regional director for the Mass Office of Business Development and worked previously for the Boston Symphony Orchestra when she managed the business partners of Tanglewood and as annual fund advisor as well as other consulting including work with Berkshire United Way. She knows where both the pockets of wealth and areas of greatest need reside in the Berkshires. So with that, I'd like to invite Nat to come to the microphone and share what uh, his work is all about and then we'll start our conversation. Either one, Either thank one. you. All right. Um, that was about the stuffiest introduction, I think. I've got to get you new lines. Um, just the um, Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, just a 30-second snapshot or so. We are a established under state law. We're a governmental sub-state district. Our commission is made up of the a member of each planning board across the region. And Pittsfield and Mount Washington have the same vote on our, on our commission. Um, we represent all 32 municipalities. We try to provide them planning technical assistance. Um, I would say the planning has gone far beyond what I ever envisioned. Um, at this point, we're doing disaster work we're doing health services on a regional basis, uh, building permits on a regional basis. There's a lot going on that goes far beyond what was traditional land use planning assistance of helping the planning boards do zoning and subdivision. Um, we also do the long range regional infrastructure planning. So we, our traditional niche was in things like wastewater and water and, trans and highways, and over the years that has, uh, I'd say highways, and that used to be what we were primarily noted for, were fights over uh, building, putting asphalt in places. I'd say the fights now are over where to put the limited money into keeping the asphalt held together. Um, the, um, but telecom, for instance, broadband, we've been involved in since 1996, and I think, Lori, you were involved at some level at that very initial thing, and we're still struggling with that. That's one of my messages. Um, so we're, we're looking at the infrastructure pieces and the municipal support pieces that help support economic growth, basically, and community well-being generally beyond just the economy. Um, just one of the questions that was out there was how do we relate, um, how much do we relate, our economy relate to the national economy? And that's a yes and no, to be honest. Um, obviously, we're Im impacted by the same trends that are Im impact the nation as a whole. Um, we actually have a very strong export economy from the region, both in manufacturing and in cultural hospitality. Both of those are really export sectors. If you look from base economic theory back to your, you know, old class days, you know, those are the activities that bring outside money in that help support the local population. And we have a very strong export economy. We're very fortunate that way. Um, but obviously, the rest of the world gets affected or the rest of the country gets affected, we get affected too. There are some very peculiar Berkshire issues. Cost of energy here is very high. Um, there is a considerable lack of state and national resources for infrastructure investment. And, you know, there's a lot of national media on how bad our infrastructure is becoming even in comparison to some second world countries, 
and believe me, that's true here. Um, there certainly is a issue of tax for of tra tax uh, transfer of tax revenues to other jurisdictions. Uh, all I have to do is look at the sales tax allocation that goes to support the math, the MBTA, and the serves the Greater Boston region. We pay sales tax into it. The Berkshire Regional Transit Authority doesn't get a dime back. And you want to know why our transit service is so weak? there's part of the problem, that there we're, we're transporting tax dollars that are generated within the region and they're going somewhere else. But we also have a regional culture of trying to be more self-sufficient. Um, and really this is born out of 250 years of necessity, is we've always been a relatively isolated region of, I think, I think just generally people who come to the mountains tend, and I don't care whether it's in West Virginia or in Berkshire County, I think they tend to think more independently. I mean, that's just a personal bias and observation of mine. Um, over the past 20 years, well, 15 years, we have gone counter to some national trends. We don't overly thrive in booms, but we don't overly bust in bus. And since the since the last big GE pullout in the mid early 90s, we have been in the 2001 recession and in this last recession, our unemployment didn't go as high, it went later, and it never went as high, and it has started to pull back faster. That 30 years ago, that was absolutely not the case in Berkshire County. We went deeper, faster, and came out slower and lower than if you looked at national trends. Um, I think one of the interesting things is we still have a very locally based financial banking system. If you look around the region, you know, TD Bank North is our only sort of big multi-state bank that has a presence here. We're, we really have a financial system based on local dollars and the local banks primarily. And those banks did not act, they weren't in the same playing field as the big national banks that were, uh, that got us into, into the latest mess. Um, they've always been run fairly conservatively and their basis of business is investing in local businesses. Um, so that's, that's something that, you know, and you can go to other places. I've, I've got a son out in Moab, Utah. Their banks are all big national banks that are, are part of the problem. Um, you know, over the past 40 years, we've gone from being a region that was based on major employers, national firm-based manufacturers, and that economy to a much more diverse, both in sectors and in size, set of economic players in the region. Um, we have a much higher percentage of sole proprietorships in this region than the surrounding regions, the Commonwealth as a whole, or the state as a whole. Uh, we're about double the national and state average for sole proprietorships and, uh, and at that level of, of uh, empl employer and wage earners. Um, we went over the past 40 years from a high wage level area to one that's actually is well below state averages and at national averages. And that was that transition from manufacturing that even, you know, the not even the high school graduate who was working at, in an assembly line could make a good living wage to one that those people struggle at this point. And, and we have a lot of them. Um, just from an income statistic standpoint, we, out of 351 municipalities in Massachusetts. Pittsfield is 338th in income. Adams is 346th. And North Adams is 348th. So that's one of those things to keep in mind about how those traditional mill-centric communities have been what they deal with over the past 40 years 
and all of them, of course, have lost a lot of population. I mean, Adams is about half the size it was in 1970. Um, and I know I always, I'm always sensitive to geography and I real, in this county, and I realize a lot of folks that may happen to live south of Pittsfield don't necessarily understand some of the dynamics a bit further north. Um, and that's where the bulk of our population is. So, you know, all, and I know I always have to keep it in mind, I'm not Joe Lunchbox. I need to remember there's a whole group of people out there, a pretty sizable one, that are, are struggling, are still struggling through a 40-year transition. Um, we do have a very lily-white population traditionally. Uh, it was diverse as far as whether you were Italian, Polish, or Irish, or back to my Allen ancestors, but nonetheless, it was a white population. It's diversifying, but very slowly. Um, the numbers are going up, but our Latino population is maybe 3.5%. And if you look across the Northeast, the place, all the population growth throughout the Northeast, the places that are growing, it's based on primarily Latino and Asian populations moving in. It's not based on those of us who, you know, were born and, and raised here. Um, we have some real issues in the region of la aging labor force. Uh, basically, the young working age population has left to a large extent. And that also obviously drives down how many young kids we have in our communities. Our energy costs are high. Uh, access has always been an issue. I've seen newspaper articles from back in the 1850s where they were talking about even getting through the region or to the region, what a problem it was. It's always been a problem. Um, it's probably increasingly important to us to be able to relate transportation-wise to the two mega regions three hours away from us. Um, we have an image of being part of a high cost state, even though we're really pretty moderately cost here. But that's a hard image to overcome in, in marketing to those who might, you might want to try to attract. Uh, our telecom and energy infrastructure is obsolete. It, um, you know, those who are basing your being able to call on the phone or use your broadband on Verizon, in three to five years, that system will be dead. Um, and we have some real issues of size and scale that while we have a very increasingly diverse economy, there's not much scale or depth to it. So when something happens, it has more of kind of a immediate hiccup effect that affects other things. And you, you see it show up in odd places or maybe not so odd. The trailing spouse issue comes up because there's not enough here that if the trailing spouse has something that's, you know, they're not a medical professional or educational specialist, they probably are going to have a hard time finding a job here. You know, if they don't have a pretty generic skill set, it becomes increasingly hard. So those are all kinds of issues within our, our environment. Thanks, Lori. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Pamela Lumphy, and I represent One Berkshire here tonight, which is an effort that, um, for all intents and purposes, was really long ago uh, one of the babies of, of Lori Norton Moffat and of Ellen Spear. Uh, what we do is that we are a newly born organization that represents currently four organizations, Berkshire Economic Development Corporation, Berkshire Creative, the Berkshire Chamber of Commerce, and Berkshire Visitors Bureau. And in that alliance is really the understanding of, of I think, where we were 25, 35, 40 years ago, which to Nat's point that this was a strongly uh, manufacturer-based economy, um, we always had pockets and, and uh, you know, strong pockets of creativity. We always had strong pockets of uh, culture. We always had strong pockets of tourism. I think what's happened over the last decade and over the last five years more specifically is an understanding that 
Um, these are all huge, strong parts of this economy that the creative sector is in fact, because, you know, again, to Nat's point, we do have a disproportionate number of sole proprietors here. Um, so what are we doing to support those voices? Um, some of them that I'm sure have felt very lonely over the years and undervalued and unrepresented. Um, well now through Berkshire Creative, they have an opportunity to be heard, uh, to be an aggregate voice that I think is increasingly becoming very powerful, um, not only here, but throughout the state of Massachusetts, which I think has really been a leader when recognizing the creative economy. But it's also understanding that tourism is in fact a piece of our economy. And that I think in the past what we tended to do was we didn't even really understand that we had this amazing network of creatives living here. Um, we, we tended to uh, put to the side the importance of the tourism dollars that were coming into this community. And I think that a lot of the nonprofits, particularly the culturals, uh, were often seen as the poor stepchild. You know, they weren't real business. And I think one of the things that has really changed um, recently, and why I think that One Berkshire is so important in this community and so different from really any other region in Massachusetts, um, and, and potentially throughout the country, is that this community really recognizes that we have a very diverse economy, but if we don't all uh, understand and respect that diversity, um, if we don't consolidate resources, if we don't become more effective in how we're marketing ourselves, how we are trying to support business, recruit business in, um, we're sunk. And I think that more and more throughout the state of Massachusetts, the Northeast, the United States, that kind of understanding, I think, has to begin to take over our more global economy, that we're all in this together. Uh, and it's, to me, it's, it's when I think of the Berkshire economy and why I have such a, a sense of optimism about it is, is because there is this new understanding of the creative culture, um, the creative economy that exists here. There is a new appreciation for the impact that the cultural organizations and Lori could probably off the top of her head know what the Norman Rockwell's uh, economic impact is to this community. Um, I know that when I was with Tanglewood, we did a, a study that brought together and brought to light what, what is really Tanglewood doing? You know, for, I think for a lot of people, whether it's the Rockwell or Jacob's Pillow or it's um, Mass Mocha, you know, great, we have museums and we have theaters, but what is it that they really do to make an impact? Well, with Tanglewood's case, when they, they decided we're going to demonstrate that the culturals really do have a significant uh, place in the economy in Berkshire County, what was recognized through this, uh, this study is that on a, an annual basis, Tanglewood is one example, um, has a $60 million impact on this community. And I'm sure that if the Rockwell and others, and in fact that was one of the pieces from this nonprofit study that was done for the region, that the economic impact of the nonprofits here is substantial and something that, again, as an economy, we have to gain more of an appreciation for it. I think we are. And the alliance of One Berkshire is really bringing together all of these different elements, no different than the tourism community. Um, when you look at Jiminy Peak, if you look at some of the other resorts that are out here, some of which are world famous, um, they have a huge impact out here, and yet for years, traditionally, what we did is say tourism is over there, and we don't even know what this creative thing, it's over there, and the culturals are over there, it's, we're all about manufacturing. And even though there is still a very thriving core of manufacturing uh, businesses out here, they too are turning the corner in understanding that what we're doing with the film industry, with graphic design, with architecture from the creative point of view, um, the culturals that are growing by leaps and bounds. And as part of this nonprofit uh, study that was done years ago, or now it's probably three years ago, the chamber is actually just about, um, I think within the next two to three weeks, going to have a press conference uh, to have the, the newly uh, updated uh, study be brought to the public. But the exponential 
increase within the arts and the cultural communities here over the last 10 years is absolutely stunning. And it's like few other regions uh, in the country, never mind within Massachusetts. And so from my perspective, um, part of what I'm charged in, in doing for One Berkshire is to make sure that I'm out visiting companies, understanding from a regional level what are the challenges, what are the opportunities of those companies. And from Nat's perspective, Nat wants to understand is sort of in a, a long range planning capacity, what do we have to do as a region to be ready for, you know, when it comes to bridges, when it comes to housing, when it comes to transportation, when it comes to broadband. What I'm trying to do is in the short term, who are the people and the partners that can be brought together and connected in order that we fully support our existing um, economic community here. And as much as I want to, and it's certainly part of my charge to, to bring new companies into Berkshire County, we have so many companies here that have the potential for growth, and I think that's something that Keith is undoubtedly going to talk about, that those are the companies that we want to be paying attention to. We want to look at the sole proprietors or the micro businesses that have two, three, four people. What are we doing to help them grow and to feel as though they have a voice and a, a meaningful voice in this community? And I do think that that day is here, and it was, you know, refreshing for me, I had said to Lori that this past week I was in Boston uh, as part of a, a regional group of uh, economic development people that got together to report out on activity within the region. And at least three times through the course of this roundtable, someone said, for instance, with the creative economy, where they were really trying to boost, and this was on the Cape, you know, what they were doing with their entrepreneurs, what were they doing with their sole proprietors, their, their creatives. And they looked across the table and they said, we, we need to do what Berkshire County's doing. Um, and there were lots of comments made like that, which was really refreshing, because you know, we are this little place with, you know, a small population. And yet, in many ways, I think particularly with economic development, um, we've really helped to lead the way. And, you know, an obvious example is, of course, Lena Fruscio, who was the director of Berkshire Creative, uh, just left within the last eight months to go work for the state because she's now the state's director for the creative economy, um, which is a wonderful, uh, you know, collaboration and a relationship that we have on a state level in recognizing what the Berkshires is doing um, out here and not just from the creative sector again, it's traditional business, it's tourism, it's the cultural community, it's the nonprofits, all of us coming together and understanding that, you know, at the end of the day, if, if we don't all, you know, jump in the same boat and start pulling the oars in the same direction, we're never going to have the number of people, the amount of money, the resources that are necessary if we kind of stay in separate silos. So I'm incredibly excited by the work of One Berkshire. Um, and look forward to any questions that you might have. Good evening. Um, I have a confession to make. In preparing my materials tonight, I took a slight liberty with the title of the forum, and I added the word how. As you may recall, it's can we flourish? So my presentation, to some degree, is how can we flourish? And for those of you who like to flip quickly to the end of the book, the um, three-mile version of how can we flourish is by creating opportunity and by being relevant. Now, there'll be more to come with that if people are interested. But how did I get to those ideas? Well, I have another confession to make. I'm not an economist. And although I've worn down a lot of pencils and calculators and daily work the spreadsheets, uh, my comments tonight are not really based on economic theory or even really economic fact. It's based on experiences and based on my perspective. So let me tell you a little bit about my perspective. Uh, as you probably remember, uh, I work for the Massachusetts Small Business Development Center Network. It's a big title, right? Uh, essentially, in the Berkshires, we're, we have a center here. We're one of a thousand centers 
a, a one of six in the state and one of a thousand across the U.S. and U.S. territories. So it's a big network of these business support centers. In addition to those six centers in the state of Massachusetts, we also have a set of centers that deals with government procurement, getting government contracts at the state, federal, and local level. A lot of folks don't realize that. In the state of Massachusetts, th that group did about $170 million uh, of business with, uh, with, with small businesses in terms of getting government contracts. We also have a set of centers that deals with exporting goods and services to other countries called Mass Export. A few years ago, they received a presidential award for excellence, and they did about $190 million in business in the state of Massachusetts. So those are resources that are available here, right here in Berkshire County for you. Um, my perspective involves, uh, on a yearly basis, I work with, and my, my colleagues work with, in Berkshire County, 200 to 250 businesses a year. Um, and we do that through a collaboration of the uh, SBA, Small Business Administration, on the federal level, the state of Massachusetts through its Office of Business Development, as well as uh, through a college or a university. Uh, we have four colleges and universities in the state that we work with. Uh, uh, in Berkshire County here, we're directly out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and in fact, I'm actually out of the Eisenberg School of Management. So the idea is this, is that if you have a high level of federal, state, and university resources, that's a rich pool, rich pool to help small businesses uh, start, grow, and develop. So um, getting back to the role, what we do is we do roll up your sleeves, hands-on work in individual businesses, all confidential and all free once you fill out a short form. Um, and so my perspective is essentially our, our work is helping to build regional, state, and even national economies what I like to say is one business at a time. So what do we see? What do I see from, uh, from, from that perspective? Well, lots of things, but I'd like to comment on two things tonight. Uh, in terms of challenges and things that have affected uh, how business is conducted uh, and maybe how it's not conducted. The first is the decrease in the value of real estate. Decrease in the value of real estate. Well, it has a lot of impact, certainly on a personal level, because your net worth decreases, right? You have less net worth. On a business perspective, it affects it as well because it affects their net worth or their equity in their business, their fixed asset. Sometimes if they own a building or property, that's depreciated. There's a secondary effect to that. And the secondary effect to that is that it decreases their capacity to borrow funds. Loans require collateral in real estate is generally, before this, this period that we've gone through, was considered a pretty solid asset, pretty solid piece of collateral. So uh, in a small business, you all sometimes have to pledge your own personal asset, your own personal home. And if that's decreased in value, that's affected it. And certainly if you're a business, and I work with many businesses that are now um, stymied in terms of being able to access capital, because of a lack of collateral or decreased collateral. Um, the, second, the second factor I'd like to just briefly comment is uh, the loss of jobs. Now I know that, uh, Laura, you mentioned that there's a lot of unfilled jobs here, and that's great, you know, and I know that the national economy is different, a little bit different than the Berkshire economy, but we, we'd all, I think, all have to admit that we're experiencing, uh, you know, uh, an issue with the uh, loss of jobs. And I have a couple of graphs that I'd like to just quickly show that just gives a perspective on what we might be talking about. And I apologize for the size of it, but I did highlight it. Um, essentially, this is basically, uh, you have a baseline at the top, and this is job loss with the current recession as compared to the Great Depression. Now, the, the line that goes the furthest down is obviously the Great Depression, and it's over a period of time. So if you look at, and I know you can't see it, but essentially it drops way down, and this is a percentage relative to peak employment, okay? It's, so it's just a, a way to do it. And you can see that in the Great Depression, it went way down, uh, nearly 22%. And it recovered a little bit beyond 132 months. Okay, that gives you just a perspective. Here on the top is what we're going through right now. It's not as deep. You can see that graphically, uh, hopefully. It's not as deep. I, it's only maybe about a third as deep. Uh, and this goes, this is data, by the way, as of February 2012. And this goes to month 48. 
Okay, so, you know, compared to the Great Depression, that's not so bad, right? Okay. Second graph has to deal with a comparison of all the recessions as of, as, uh, from 1948. The one in the bottom, that's the current one we've gone, we're going through. Now, you can clearly see that all the others uh, are not as deep, and they recovered much quicker. And this is at month 48, and there's no telling where it might get to baseline. Okay? Um, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because of a point I'd like to make, uh, and hopefully discuss a little bit. And the point I'd like to make is that uh, it's probably not so much more about finding a job and fitting into it, as probably it's more about creating an opportunity. Um, and the folks that I see, a lot of them are displaced. They're displaced from the workforce. And one of the options that they think about is starting a job, starting a business. Uh, and of course, there's, there's issues around having a business and having a job. It's, it's a jo uh, having a business is not a replacement for a job. But they're displaced. Uh, and, um, and as I see more and more of that, it's just really striking me that what, we're, what it's really about, it's about creating value. It's about creating opportunity rather than fitting into an existing structure. Now that's a completely different mindset. That's a big shift. Psychologically, skill-wise, situationally. How does one create value? How does one seek opportunity? It's different. You know, uh, sometimes I'll ask when I do presentations, I'll say, well, how many people drove here? Pretty much everybody will put up their hands. I said, okay, now how many people drove here looking in the rear view mirror or to the sides? No one, right? Because you'd crash. How many people run their businesses doing that, though? They look at their, what they, their past performance or they look what's going on? We really haven't been very good at helping people be able to learn the skill and the ability to be able to project forward. That's very, very difficult. And that's one of the things that we work with. Uh, we work with people in terms of business because one of the things we consistently hear is the uncertainty that they're faced with. How does one, you know, if you use past landmarks, past reference points, past things that you did before, they're not working. Uh, and it takes a while. Um, I had meetings just today, actually, <laughs> with folks who are st starting to try and get their uh, minds around and their themselves around this idea that even though I've owned this business for 60 years, uh, I'm not doing well and I have to do something very different. So it requires a different way of, of thinking and acting and doing. And as a community, um, I think it requires other kinds of structures, other kinds of ways of assisting communities assisting businesses uh, and assisting individuals to be able to do that. Um, and one thing I'm very fond of, 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 ta of thinking about and talking about whenever I can is what's called place-based entrepreneurism. And it's saying that there is a characteristics and attributes of a space, of a place, that can further entrepreneurism. So it, 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 if, the, if the chain of logic is something like creating value, that's what, what we're talking about, an opportunity, then I think entrepreneurism Innovation, change is all part of that. There's an underbelly to that. And the underbelly is that we can all say, yeah, we, we, can, we can get behind that banner and we can march in that parade. But change is difficult and change is hard in the communities. So thank you very much. Mark Salkowitz, and I live in Pittsfield, a native of the area here. Uh, I'm very curious about the one Berkshire situation uh, I think it's a good idea, but I haven't heard, maybe it's too early, but I haven't heard too much about what are their goals, measurable goals, and such things as, you know, what kind of businesses, not necessarily industry businesses, are they going after and how are they going to go after them? And what are they planning to do about the locals, entrepreneurs? And thirdly, I think most important, education for the people that are here so that they can stay here. So I've heard that. I think uh, Nat had mentioned about, you know, we're an older 
age group, I represent them, and, uh, and you, you see so many times the younger age group just um, seem to be going away. Uh, the reason that I was in Boston the other day was because we were there um, on being paid from a regional economic development organization grant, which is a redo. Um, and the reason that we were gathered the other day was because we have reporting tools. Um, and so I'm reporting out on behalf of one Berkshire. And it's, it's very measured. It's looking at, you know, who are you visiting? Who are you helping um, to retain? Because it's something that the Commonwealth and many states are not necessarily very good at. And I think they've become much better at recognizing that uh, retaining jobs is as important as growing a business. And so we're measured on what are we doing to help businesses retain workers, bring in workers, uh, what are we looking at in terms of private investment that's happening in the community. Um, also understanding something that happens here in Berkshire County because we have the tools to do it. Um, recently I met with General Dynamics and they were going through all of what they've gone through to hire their now probably 125 employees. And I asked them, do you know what your economic impact is based on bringing all those people in? And the people that you bring in on temporary basis because of all their work with the, the government. And actually Mike Soprano, it's from the chamber, who's a one Berkshire Alliance member, uh, has the software in order to do that so that they could then take that information um, which only helps them because they're considering bringing another project to Pittsfield. So we are very much measured on, on what we're doing and part of what you know my task is is to make sure that I'm out in the community talking with businesses, understanding what their needs are. And a lot of what we do, and I think Keith is a great example of this, it's connecting the dots. You know, there's a lot of people that, that wind up seeing Keith because they need a Keith and they don't know that a Keith exists. Um, there's a lot of people that need small grants, for instance, and don't know that the Pittsfield Economic Revitalization Corporation, which is a misnomer because it's actually a Berkshire-wide organization, has technical assistance grants. Um, so for me, a lot of what I'm trying to do in my job is also connecting the dots for companies so that they can retain workers and that they can grow. I think longer term, Mark, um, because there is such a focus on retaining companies that are here, um, we want to make them strong so that as we're trying to get other companies to look at Berkshire County, that they know that our existing companies have been treated well and supported. Um, there's, there's two issues that you raise, one around education and one that keeps popping up here tonight, and it's around workforce. Um, I, I think we all understand that there is this disconnect in that we have nearly the same number of people that are employed that we have job openings. So what's, why aren't we just popping these people into these jobs? Well, the problem is, is that they don't have the appropriate training to transition into these jobs. And so what we're constantly doing is trying to develop ways, working with the Regional Employment Board, working with the state. Um, there are training dollars available uh, to make sure that, that we can help people make those transitions. Um, but it needs more money. There are people here that are more than willing and able to do it, but it does need more money. Um, and the, the second piece is I think when we look at education, um, I know for Central and South County, as opposed to North County, which has, for many of you who may know, has a phenomenal vocational high school called McCann. Um, these kids get out of high school, and I think 98% of their grads go into either college or work. 100% um, of them, I think, pass the MCAS. Um, and it's because it is just so centered on providing career pathway education for these kids. We don't have anything like that in Central and South County, and you may have read um, that the state has come back with a report for the city of Pittsfield, but it's going to impact um, southern parts of the county as well to say Pittsfield has to do something different with its career pathway. And I think that that's a dawning of a new age for Central and South, is that I believe that the path that they're going to take is in creating a state-of-the-art high school that's preparing kids, um, certainly still for college, but it's going to take on um, 
not a traditional vocational, although it will have those elements as well, um, but new um, technology um, that's emerging that can help kids either go on to college if that's what they wish to do or, or just to help prepare them to go immediately into the workforce. Um, that's a huge disconnect for us right now in Central County. And if I had a magic wand, what I'd love to see happen with that school, which is something that's happened in Eastern Mass at a school called Assabet, they, you know, the school closes at 3 o'clock. At 3.30, it reopens as an adult education um, uh, center where they offer 250 courses a year. They've made it into a huge profit center. So for all the people that they're providing training for in, you know, database management or, you know, getting certifications in different things, they're able to take the monies in that they're collecting at, at market value. They're not gouging these people to take the courses. They're, they're very inexpensive. And they put the money back into the school to buy new computers and to update all the things that are at the school. That's what I, I would hope we could do. And I, I think it'll make for an amazing shift for Central and South County. Have you decided what kind of businesses you want to go after and how? I, you know, I look at uh, who is it that has successfully come here and is growing here. And I think as both Keith and Nat have said, we have an incredibly diverse economy here. One of the things that we're trying to demonstrate is that this is a place that has obviously a history of manufacturing and we have brought in some small manufacturers. It's also a, a place for emerging technologies. I think it's why we've seen the growth at General Dynamics and Sabic. Um, it's a place where there are offshoots for medical research and we've seen that with places like Nuclea. Um, but it, it's also a place, and again this is why I think the importance of recognizing the creative economy is so important here. There are thousands of individuals who live here and thrive here as single proprietors, and we don't want to forget them as part of the mix. That, to Keith's point about place, um, part of the reason that people have stayed here and why they're coming here is because of this place. So that's all wrapped together in in how we want people to stay here but to come here as well. But I would say that those are you know, some of the industries that, that we're still very interested in, particularly the manufacturing piece. It remains a core legacy industry here. Yeah. You know, I think they, today, you, know, you don't have to be in New York if you're financial, you know, with the tech, uh, all the tech stuff. Um, a lot of these companies need back rooms, which they don't want to pay the high rent of New York. And going to New Jersey, I would hope maybe they'd come to the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. One of the problems probably is we don't have the uh, workforce to take care of that. I mean, they aren't trained yet, but uh, have you given much thought to that? Yes, absolutely, but I'm not sure that I would agree necessarily or 100% with the workforce in that case. I think that one of the things that is a challenge for us here um, is broadband, and we are still hampered outside of communities like Pittsfield, who probably is one of the few com communities that is fully covered, except if you go into West Pittsfield past BCC, you suddenly get into a dead zone. Um, probably close to where you live, Mark, is, uh, is tough for broadband. Um, that continues to be a, a huge issue for us. There is a remarkable organization called Wired West that is out here that has done some phenomenal work with trying to get that last mile of fiber optics out here. Um, I would encourage all of you get, to get to know as much as you can about them. They're a remarkable organization that I think is making real strides. But to me, that's, that is a big challenge still for getting the kind of people that you're talking about into Berkshire County. Uh, one of the questions I, uh, we work with on a pretty much a daily basis is, uh, can we grow the answers here? Uh, you know, I know that part of the mix involves importing or uh, getting um, uh, the answers from other places, but can we grow the answers here? And then the corollary question is, what would it take? 
You know, um, I deal with it on an individual basis when I'm dealing with individual businesses. You know, can you can you solve the the, the, the questions that you have? Do you have the answers? What would it take for you to? Well, first of all, where's the opportunity? Are you clear about where the opportunity? Can we quantify it? Can we look at it carefully? And if so, what would it take to get to that opportunity? What would you need? How can we do that? Then the rest becomes mechanical. The spreadsheets and the pencil pushing and the calculators and the, the, you know, the research and everything becomes the, the, the mechanisms to get to that. But um, I, I like to tease out that question is, you know, uh, can we grow our answers here? As well as look from outside, but can we grow our answers here? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about how Norman Rockwell Museum is trying to grow its answers for looking at the future. And it will spark some technology conversation, I hope. Uh, we're not alone in the cultural sector in looking at the impact of technology on delivery of our product. And while direct tourism to this museum uh, brings in a tremendous base of support, not only for Norman Rockwell Museum, but drivers of businesses all throughout the community, and we see about 130,000 visitors annually. Uh, we export our exhibitions and we serve about 500,000 visitors at other museums around the country who are seeing our work. Uh, three to four times as many people seeing the work we produce here in other parts of the country and the world. Increasingly, we're looking to the generations who expect to receive their experiences online to be able to have any time, anywhere access to the product they're interested in. And our product is art, our exhibitions, our artists, our paintings, our, our archives. And we're in the process of and have digitized a great deal of that material. And now we're at the point where we need to repurpose it into the experiences that young people expect both on site here as well as what you can download in the app store onto your iPhone or experience on the computer from anywhere. Just yesterday, we had immense business disruption and interruption because we went from a single T-line to installing four T-lines because we can't manage the volume of activity coming in and out of our business with the one. And we put this off for about five years because when we last quoted it, it was going to cost us something like $18,000 a month to have this kind of access and we waited and I, I don't know the numbers of what we bought it for this time but we had to have it. We're doing distance learning. Uh, Stephanie Plunkett, our deputy director, has been teaching a uh, graduate level course in illustration art with the Mass College of Art, uh, Maryland Col Institute of Art and doing that uh, through distance learning, sometimes going there but mostly teaching over the wires. And we're in the process now of recognizing that our very long time, stable, talented, knowledgeable, artistic, and skilled staff here don't all have the technology skills that are needed to deliver the services that are expected by patrons of the future. And we have set up a training program. And I want to see if there's any of that money available you talked about for training. Um, what we call our Tech Tips Tuesday workshops that happen weekly and we teach some new aspect of technology, applications, hardware, social media, uh, whatever uh, people need to learn to try to upgrade the, and modernize the skill sets of uh, a staff that's been together for a long time and is really last century's employees. And this I think is, I'm being very open about this, I think every business is facing this unless they're hiring these new talents in by 20 and 30 year olds, the um, more senior and mature worker must learn these skills. And I think your concept and idea of after school training so that even existing employed, not only out of work, but currently employed, uh, very productively employed workers need the ability and the settings to learn these new technologies to be able to bring someone in here uh, develop an app to take a Norman Rockwell experience of how he painted uh, this wonderful picture of saying grace and look at all the photographs of the models and listen to the videos we have of the models and their in the interviews and maybe understand what the dynamics of transportation were at that time and some of the history lessons with it or the four freedoms behind me the possibilities are limitless 
But I think we're living in an interesting era where we have to um, not only attract new businesses, but to remain competitive um, as existing thriving businesses have the tools for retraining. So I wonder if others here are experiencing that in their work um, and what services are available in our community to help with that training. If there are no services in this community to help with those kinds of transitions for existing workers, then I think we have a real gap in the education of maintaining a competitive workforce in this county. You made a comment about broadband being dead in five years. Would you like to address that? Three, three to five. Um, well, so how can I... Um, First, I would encourage everybody in the room, when you go home and when you go to your business, go to the Mass Broadband Institute website. So just Google it and go to their website, and they have an application on there for mapping. And you type in your address, and they have an application within that, that it will give them the information and show you the information about what your download and upload speeds are. One of our staff members told me this morning, this is just by happenstance, he did this from his home over in, uh, I don't know, he lives down Route 20 somewhere, over, over the hill, um, Russell or in that area. When he did that last night, he didn't realize this was there and he happened to go on last night. Broadband at the federal level is measured at four megabits per second in one direction and one megabit in per direction in the download direction. He's on DSL, quarter mile from a Verizon central office in Chester or wherever it is he lives. His speeds actually happening were one quarter of that. So when our incumbent, and I, I'm not going to Verizon bash, they happen to be our incumbent and that's who we got to bash because that's who we got. So what we really have is essentially fast becoming a third world broadband speed issue across most of our communities and Pam you're wrong Pittsfield will be in the same boat other than they do have those that have Time Warner you're in better shape because their system is in better shape and, and is capable of it the basic old telephone system forget it and what's happening is the applications that are being applied Netflix, you know, getting Netflix downloaded when you want to watch it on Friday night are eating up so much capacity the system can't keep up with it. And the, the growth in broadband needs is going up exponentially every year. So the system is basically dying and Verizon milked everything it could out of old copper wires. And those that, and you know, bless them that they did. I'm not blaming them for doing it but it is the way it is. And us as a region, that leaves us in a, what's rapidly becoming third world status. And they, Verizon has said they will not invest any more than basically the regulators require them to invest in a place like Berkshire County. And you know, we're not unique at this. We are somewhat very blessed by, as Pam said, we've got this set of incredibly dedicated volunteers who've been leading the Wired West effort, which is a fiber to the home solution. And the numbers sound big, maybe a million dollars per community. It's spread over all of Western Massachusetts, a couple of million dollars. In the long run, that's pocket change. I mean, I deal with highways that a quarter of a mile costs us a couple of million dollars to upgrade. So, you know, you put it in those kinds of contexts, it doesn't you know, the numbers really are small, but we haven't dealt with it yet. And 25 in Berkshire County, 25 or 26 of our municipalities have no broadband. So, you know, and, and as we deal with a lot of home entrepreneurs, a lot of self-employed people who increasingly to be competitive are going to need this, we got to deal with this situation because they're not going to be able to thri thrive out there. But in fact, the copper wire running down the street in Great Barrington or in Pittsfield or in North Adams 
in three to five years will not be able to, to deal with broadband, uh, providing broadband in any sense or fashion. It's just the system is simply going to die. And, I, you know, how many of us get on on Saturday night and you want to do something or whenever it is and you, and you realize, gee, my computer seems, you know, my internet seems to be really running really slow. That's not your computer. It's because the DSL box down the road has, is loaded up and is just can't quite handle it all. That's what's happening. My name is Rosalie Berger, and I'm the owner of RTR Technologies. And RTR Technologies manufactures um, de-icing, corrosion prevention system, air conditioning systems for the railroads worldwide. And we are located in two different places. We are, our headquarters are in the Norman Rock, the original Norman Rockwell Museum. And RTR does stand for Rosalie the Riveter. And we are a woman-owned business in the transit industry. And um, we've been here for about 15 years. Our manufacturing is in Canaan, Connecticut. We love being here. We moved up from New York because this was our favorite place to be, and we were outgrowing our business where we were in Scarsdale. And we decided to move here in hopes that our favorite place would support us in still loving this place while we do our business. And there's no doubt that it does, absolutely. And I have a lot of artist friends here as well. And I, want, I don't want to talk about my business at the moment, but I wanted to ask, with all of the arts and the creativity that are going on here, are the artists that live here able to support themselves? Is this economy truly supporting themselves? I utilize artists all, all the time, whenever I can, because that speaks to me. This establishment is absolutely fabulous. And as I was sitting here, there are millions of people who come here, as there were hundreds of thousands of people that passed through the original Norman Rockwell Museum. I want to know what people are thriving here with all of the creative efforts. It would make me very happy to have that be the case. Is that really the case? And I'll also say that, as I said, we love being here. We um, came here, we were a, a $3 million company. And we believed in ourselves very, very much. We're now significantly stronger than that because we are the solution to all winter challenges for the railroads. We make certain that passengers get where they're going in comfort and in ease. We have a factory of, of about 20 people, 23 people down in Canaan. And my biggest concern is the SBA is the reason that RTR Technologies exists today because RTR Technologies had a terrible 9-11 crash and practically closed. And Keith knows, we've worked with Keith, he is a dynamic, creative person. Worked with John Whalen, who I dragged here tonight, although I'm sure he was coming in any case. We have utilized so many wonderful people here. Here's my complaint. And I did say the SBA is the only reason that RTR is alive today because they carried us through 9-11 with a 9-11 economic recovery loan when the banks who held our loans from the earlier, the late 1990s wouldn't look at us during the crash. And so I asked the SBA if I could be their poster child and I would still want to be their poster child if I could. My concern is that the financial institutions here don't really understand business and are not here in support of business. And we have proven ourselves to be a very solid, strong company that came through the very toughest of depressions in my life, in any case. And we still don't have the support that we need here financially. The SBA has just come out with a wonderful program, they always do, to support manufacturing um, throughout the country. And I really think that it, if it's taken seriously by the financial institutions, we'll revitalize manufacturing, which is so sorely needed here. I mean, we have, we have 
very wealthy people who live in this area, who thrive on the arts and who thrive in the theaters and who thrive in the restaurants. But then again, they go home to their lovely homes in New York or Boston or Long Island or New Jersey. And we see them periodically. And the interesting thing that I have found is that I wondered when I came here where I was going to get a pastrami sandwich. I mean, that was one of my main concerns when I came here. Even at the closing of the house, where am I going to get a Reuben sandwich, you know? And then there was Great Barrington Bagel. And there are just fabulous people who've become institutions here, who've come from those wonderful areas that we just talked about and who remain here, but who are not supported enough here. So the SBA has come out with a new program called the Capline Program. And I call them because I call them all the time. And they love us, and we love them. And I said, you know, we're growing by leaps and bounds. It's staggering how we are growing, because the industry has come to know us for whom we really are. The excellence, the on-time delivery, the quality products, the unique products that keep railroads going. We de-ice the third rail. We de-ice the overhead electric wire for light rail. We de-ice the switches so trains can move and change direction without derailing. We are the leading manufacturer of threshold heating, door threshold heating on transit vehicles throughout this country. We, I, I don't even, it, I, I won't bore you with what we do, although I find it very exciting. <laughs> However, we're growing so rapidly, we need a new place. We need 35,000 square feet. I'm having difficulty finding that. We need more people to work for us on all levels, of, from production to our engineers, can't find them trained here, and we need them to grow and to prosper. We brought wonderful jobs here, we love our staff, we do the very best we can in terms of benefits and everything else, and we want to be here to continue to serve this community and our industry. So as I said, the SBA came out with this wonderful program called the Cap Line 2 program. And it will pay for 90% of all upfront manufacturing costs. And it will secure the financing, I think, 75 to 85%. And I thought when I heard, when I called over to, to the, um, my contacts there just before Thanksgiving, and I said, you know, you have a marvelous export program. I need a marvelous local program. And they said, you know, it's just been born. And I said, great, tell me all about it. And it, I, when I hung up, I said, this is the saving grace for manufacturing, for our manufacturing here. I want you to know that there was only one loan made since November in Massachusetts by any financial institution, and only 170 loans made countrywide. And we are missing the boat big time and we're being caused to struggle unnecessarily when we have an enormous service to provide to our country, to our industry, and to this lovely neighborhood that we absolutely adore. And so I need to look to you. I need to look to the banks to come forward and say, we appreciate what you've done. We believe in who you are. You struggled through your depression during 9-11, and it took us many years to recover. And we're still here, but we don't have what we need. And so, if we who love this area are still struggling, how are we going to encourage other people to come here, other manufacturers? About two years ago, we, you know, there are many programs that the MBTA is doing here, new car builds, things of that nature. That's about 700 new jobs in those programs. We're very busy providing all sorts of wonderful heating applications for them. And we kept looking around saying, here, here, we need jobs here in this state. And we have real estate for that. I mean, there was GE, there were these other large facilities. We brought this concept into headquarters, the political people in Pittsfield and surrounding, and we got nowhere, flat out nowhere. So those jobs have gone elsewhere. So I love this community and I want to be here and I want others to be here with us. 
We need young people to move into this community, to settle here, to raise their children here, to train here, to be the people that we need to staff our companies. And we have to find a way to really do that. And I want to introduce you to Bob Sullivan. Bob Sullivan is Senior Vice President of Archer Technology. We are very proud. We hired him about two years ago to be the director of our Transit Vehicles Heated Surface Program, which is radiant, heated, um, radiant heating to replace old, ugly, hot, and heavy baseboards in transit vehicles that have probably never been cleaned in 25 years. And um, Bob took a concept that my husband, Craig, who is the uh, technical and a genius of this company. I am the administrative support and built this company to support his genius. And, um, we have two of the only existing radiant heated programs on transit vehicles today, and the industry is clamoring and clamoring for more. We need resources, and we don't have them, and you've got to find a way. There's enough brilliant people in this room and in this neighborhood to come up with the answers how to help us, existing people, how to bring in new people, how to encourage young people to come here and raise their families in this beautiful neighborhood. My concern is that we are a growing, aging community, and Peter Alvarez does a wonderful job for me, but I look like everybody else that I see, and Tanglewood, and all the other wonderful um, venues that we have here. We need young people in our neighborhood to keep us growing and remaining vital. And so I have no answers. I need some help. Hopefully somebody has the answers for me. Thank you. Um, I'd like to maybe just uh, lightly address two, two things that you mentioned, Rosalie. You mentioned a lot. Uh, first, thank you for mentioning the cap lines, which is uh, actually it's an SBA old program that they revamped uh, to make it more flexible and usable for people. Um, it, is, it, is, um, it, it can be quite uh, an assistance for, for businesses. However, um, just a clarification, the SBA doesn't make the loan, it actually goes to a bank, and I think that's the frustration that you, you've experienced. Uh, for some reason, the banks are not adopting it. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, about a month ago, an SBA representative and myself made a presentation to one of the largest banks in the area, um, to t about 16 of their uh, branch manager slash lenders, um, about that, about the cap lines, to try and get them oriented and educated about that and, and the usefulness of that. And for some reason, they're not um, adopting it, and uh, I don't know. And so I, uh, I feel your frustration with that. Um, it is a useful tool. The SBA provides a loan guarantee to that money, okay? So, but the money comes from the bank, and the bank has to initiate that. So, and it has to follow the bank's underwriting criteria. Um, the SBA has some additional things that they put on it, but essentially that's what it is. So. So thanks for, for giving a word to that, and hopefully if others talk it up, maybe there's some way in which we can encourage the banks to make uh, use of this. Um, the second uh, thing that I'd like to respond to is your question is, um, uh, was about the artists. Uh, can artists here support themselves? Um, the book on that is still being written, um, and if I was to guess at what the ending chapters might be, is that yes, that some can and will. Others, perhaps not. Uh, and it's a number of different factors that are involved in that. Um, one of the things that we're trying to address from our office is provide uh, specific business planning training for artists. This is the fourth year this year that we have done this. It's a part of a Assets for Artists program out of the, that is partially sponsored uh, by Berkshire Creative, uh, by the Mass Cultural Council, and by Mass MoCA, as well as others. Uh, and so it's specifically geared towards artists in helping them plan for their business, not opposing the way in which they process information and how they put things together, but using their processes. And it's a fundamental difference there. You can end up with a relatively the same endpoint, but you use a different process. And that's one of the things that we've learned uh, and one of the things we incorporated. And in fact, it was recognized and we actually did a set of trainings out in Boston and Lowell uh, as well this last year. So, uh, so Yes, I think that some artists ha are making a living, probably not as many as we'd like to see, more could, um, but I think the reality is that the, there is a certain commercial dynamic that operates, or dynamics that operate, um, that um, are not gonna be available for everyone. Um, oftentimes it takes uh, a reapplication or redeployment of their creative 
process and the way in which they do it, looking for opportunities outside of what their natural um, go-to place would be and what they would think about where they could get. Um, and also, in many cases, and this is kind of, this is between us here, right? Uh, there is the, a, a, a funny relationship they have with money sometimes. There's some aspects to the money that get in the way of it, and it's an internal kind of thing. And that's one of the things we kind of understand, and we help them see, you know, and help them provide it. And rather than see it as whatever they're looking at it, is to see in business it's a tool. And like any tool, you want to become good at using it. And in fact, actually, money has... Uh, can be different tools, not just the same one, depending upon how you use it and deploy it. And like the cap lines is a specific tool, how you could use money in your business in a specific way. And much like there's line of credits and there's other kinds of, of money, term notes and so forth, that you can use, but uh, use it effectively, use it for the right purpose um, in that. So, so it's, it's, it's part uh, uh, using their process, it's part um, understanding certain kind of key things like money's a tool and um, and then also uh, giving them some fundamental kind of assistance with how to be able to create a framework that makes sense to them and can get a commercial value and by the way it also this I would consider uh, I would add artists uh, in that category uh, generally as inventors um, and um, inventors and you may or may not be aware of it but less than two percent of all patents make money have made money it was 1.87 about five years ago, it's less than that. So having a patent on an invention that does a better thing does not necessarily get you money. So understanding the road and understanding the dynamics that are involved in that, whether you're a patent or whether you're, you're a visual artist or a performing artist, or whether you're just a creative type who likes to think of different processes and ways of doing things, there's, there's a number of different factors that need to kind of come into that equation. So in terms of being successful as an artist or as a creative person, um, the more tools that you have, uh, the more useful, um, time sensitive and, ta and, and con contextually sensitive uh, those things are for these times, the better, the more likely you're going to be successful. But I'm John Whalen and I, um, I actually, I don't know if I would um, say that uh, I'm an artist. I think I'm a very creative business person and, and a business person in a very creative environment where I, I get to engage. Uh, creative people and artists. So I own a company called Black Ice Entertainment, which is a diversified media company. We provide uh, a, a variety of media products and, and marketing and, and um, uh, a variety of services uh, to uh, clients as far away as Malaysia and as close as uh, this very room. So uh, most of my business is from very far away. I also uh, am the president of the board of uh, uh, community access to the arts and we provide a thousand workshops to artists with developmental disabilities in the Berkshires. We, we have uh, a tremendous number of faculty artists so we represent and, and are represented by many artists. And, uh, and the other piece that I would mention is that years ago I, I chaired the entity that started the uh, Berkshire Film Commission and then for a short, for a few years was on the Berkshire Creative Economy Council. So that's all to say that uh, that I have a little bit of skin and interest in this particular topic. And what I really have is sort of like, I, I sort of come around, I kind of understand, you know, that, that uh, there are some areas where you can be very practical, and I think like the, the Regional Planning Board has not only a practical role, but a legislative mandate, and, and its um, funding comes through that mandate and its, its connection to the community. And so that's sort of, uh, I think, something where we can kind of get our hands on what you do. We kind of understand that. You also have a system that engages the community. I have attended some of the, the, uh, the things so that if the community doesn't get what you do, they have the opportunity to sit in the firehouse or the town hall or someplace else in the community and, and find out about it and engage, and that's good. And I think a similar thing for Keith um, and your organization tends to work with people regardless of what their economic status is or their uh, gender or their um, capacities even. They might be somebody who wants to start a small industry at home or they might be somebody who's looking to increase by millions of dollars the entity they have and in any case. So I think where the challenge comes in, where I sort of got very engaged in this many years ago was what can we do as individuals in the community or as people who are engaged in thinking in the community and, and, and able to kind of come together with skills? Um, what can you really do to, like, to, to, to affect 
the success of individuals in this community. And when I think about that, I do think about the area artists who are entrepreneurial, like Diane and many other people we all know. I think about people like Danny Osmond, who, who uh, owns the Dreamaway Lodge, and, and just a tremendous number of Gabrielle Sins is a wonderful artist. And you can go up and down the county and just name, we all know, tons of people. Uh, like that. And for most of those people, a lot of what we do when we get together like this is sort of a very high order of discussion, but not really sort of connected to what they're trying to do and, and what they're trying to succeed at. And I'm not sure ex exactly what the answer is, but it seemed to me that, um, you know, for me, I mean, what I can do is bring in jobs. And I, you know, so if I have the opportunity to produce a commercial that would have gotten done in New York, and we often do this quietly and people don't know we're doing it, but we can bring in, and somebody like Doug Trumbull can do something like that. He can bring in jobs. But um, the big challenge is that if I have a job that's only going to last three weeks and I can't hire the 40 people that I need during that three weeks, and then I can't, or I can't keep them on for six months, so I need to have sort of engaged and educated and smart people. And, and I think that's the same for a lot of other industries. And, uh, so the thing that I guess I wonder about is an entity like One Berkshire and, and the Berkshire Creative Economy Council, I think have a unique opportunity, but I'm not sure where you really hit the road with it, but it's, it's um, if you're going to do economic triage, there's already a lot being done to represent you know, corporate interests, to represent interests that public companies have. The banks that have been discussed are going to be very careful to represent their own interests and to follow their basic you know, principles and ideas. But if you're going to do economic triage, it seems like attracting young people, attracting a diversified population that maybe is challenged to find uh, uh, a way to start businesses in other communities. And, uh, and I think, again, like, you know, it seems like the one thing I heard Pam uh, talk about is uh, education, like creating more formidable and, and entities like uh, these collective entities, rather than trying to get money from the local community or even from the major corporations to create another tier uh, to actually do like really practical things that people like Dan Osmond and John Whalen and Diane Fertel and, and uh, Gabrielle Sensa would get, we'd understand like what this is about and do things that would, uh, so are there places where we can, uh, are, there, are there any efforts to create education or to draw or attract young people and to create systems that would help those young people stay in the Berkshires? John, that's a, a terrific summary, and I think um, we've gone past our 7 o'clock closing, so I'd like to try to summarize. Thank you for those contributions, because Keith, I think you reframed the conversation for the evening beautifully by asking how can the local economy flourish despite the world economy, and I think you all actually helped answer the question. Um, you discussed that the, the greatest um, need today to finding a job is to seizing an opportunity and creating value, not trying to fit an old model. And I think we can do that through innovation and creativity, which we have here in abundance in the Berkshires. And this will help us meet the business needs of this community, which seem to, to um, galvanize around three things, the need for capitalization, the need for highly trained employees in the specialty areas where the jobs are, including museums and railroad technology, and high-speed communications, which presents an opportunity for an entrepreneur to solve how can we maybe go around the Verizons and the Time Warners and the massive uh, companies that control the communications access and maybe invent some kind of microcellular or some kind of uh, systems that could help meet these needs, whether it's ongoing technology or training our new workers or making sure we have our communications. So there seems to be opportunity and abundance and the ability, the opportunity to create value if we could align the workforce and the education of our young people, attracting young people uh, to solve and meet these needs of the future. So I, and I thank our thought leaders. You were really put on the spot tonight. And I appreciate uh, you explaining the services that are available in our community to help support business and infrastructure and planning in this region. And I'd like to invite you to continue the conversation off mic in the lobby. We have some refreshments. And if you would like to ask anybody questions privately, you can do so there. So thanks very much. It's great to wrap the season up.